everybody. I'm Rita Savasco from Rooted in Language. I am about to give you part three of our series on literacy. Um, I had been talking about how literacy, the child's path to literacy moves through these phases. So we've talked about the pre-literacy uh, phase and we have some blogs on that and the early literacy phase. And now I'm going to talk to you about developing skills. And I like to title this, I can decode, now what? Meaning I have this new reading and writing skill, but now I have to learn how to use it. And this is the part that I think can get to be tricky. Um, I just want you to know after this comes deeper learning, I'm inserting that one because that's another one that can be kind of a kink in the chain. And then on to ah, the holy grail of independence. Okay, that's what we're all looking for. So anyway, thanks for joining me for this third episode. If you didn't catch the previous two episodes, I encourage you to go back and listen. Even if your children are farther along in their literacy journey, you can learn a good deal the more you understand the roots of their current level. So be sure to listen as we go along. Today, I'm talking about this developing skills stage of literacy. So think about this for a minute. Up to this point, kids have learned how to decode. No small task as I have been uh, discussing, but that is not the same as truly learning to read. And this related point, learning to encode, to write and spell a simple sentence, again, which was a mammoth effort, just by the way, is not the same as truly learning to write. And I just wanna stop here a minute and say that I think most people get that knowing how to write a sentence isn't the same as knowing how to write, but I'm not sure that the world really operates with this understanding that hitting this kind of early level of reading doesn't mean you really have mastered all you need to do for comprehension. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna tell you a story about one of my students. This young boy came to see me around the age of eight. His mom was very conscientious, a fine teacher, and she had successfully taught her daughter to read. But now she had two sons, her eight-year-old who was really struggling to learn how to read and your six-year-old who was showing some similar signs and some different kinds of struggles. I taught this young boy early reading and writing skills using all the strategies available to you in pin, Pinwheels Year One. But then what? And that's where we are now. And honestly, he was still thinking, so what? By now he was nine years old and he knew he had a long way to go before he was really reading and writing. And he was looking around at his friends and thinking, I am still falling short. So now we're talking about the stage between I know how literacy works and moving to I now know what I can do with these skills. I am now learning to become more proficient and efficient with reading and writing. And I'm learning how to apply these skills every day, especially every school day, but even in my personal time. To illustrate each stage of literacy, I have been sharing the analogy that literacy is like a massive wooded park. The entrance to the park is an expanse of grassy field, which I dubbed the pre-literacy stage. The, the grassy field is the pre-literacy stage. In this field, children play their way to developing their oral language skills. This stage tends to expand from zero to five years, and it's a critical stage in language development. As discussed in my first podcast in this series, we call this stage playful because children are naturally programmed to develop oral language skills. And unless there's a developmental learning weakness, they learn as they fully engage with stories, conversations, songs, sound play, and the busy exploration of being an infant, toddler, and preschool aged kids. Easy, right? By contrast, the onset of literacy is like a huge iron gate that sits at the entrance to the park. When we teach children to read, we open the gate and we welcome them through. I call this a gate because for the majority of children, we must show them how to open this gate. We must intentionally usher them into the park 
by explicitly teaching them how to read and write. I explained this in the second podcast. This does not mean that all fun games and joy are over, but it does mean we need to engage children's attention, show them how, help them succeed, and provide sufficient practice so they develop a basic level of competency. I reviewed with you that both our Pinwheels Year One program and our online training class called Phonics and Spelling will show you how we teach children to turn their oral language skills into early literacy skills. So now a basic competency level has been achieved. Your child has learned some letters, mostly consonants and a few vowels, and they can read, write, and correctly spell some simple words. They've gained a start to the reading, writing, and spelling code. They know what a sentence is and how it should look. They can read a story and write a few original thoughts on paper. This is all grand and amazing, but wow, there are still so many skills to master. Kids have a long way to go, all the way from here to reading and comprehending chapter books and other texts, all the way from here to writing and organizing ideas within an entire paper. Mastering this skill in various formats over a lifetime. All of a sudden, what started as a gentle, meandering path has become a hike through an endless forest. And for some kids, this hike is met with what feels like insurmountable chasms. This brings us back to my young student, now nine years old, who faced many chasms on his literacy journey. He had dyslexia. We weren't yet sure if he also had dysgraphia and he had a serious case of discouragement and dismay in spite of his slow but steady progress that we'd made together. Because when challenge is high, so is resistance. So let me say that again. When challenge is high, so is resistance. When progress is slow, it's difficult to believe that the final summit can ever be reached. My young student, like so many young people, didn't understand that literacy mastery takes time. And I find this to really be true. Most kids just think, I wanna know how to read. They don't really realize, and write, they don't really realize that this takes time. He observed his parents and his older sibling using these skills with relative ease as older, siblings might do. He assumed it should be magic, not work. And because of his dyslexia, furthering these skills was mega work for him. He knew every step was going to be hard for him and he was only willing to engage for very brief periods of time each day. I had to keep him moving along, gently pushing to the next level without triggering his feelings of inadequacy. Ironically, I also had to allow him time to become proficient and feel empowered while also embedding these small challenges. I needed him to see he could succeed at one level, but then shift up to the next level without immediate failure. If your child faces chasms, be sure to read our blog, Potholes in the Path to Literacy. Because we work with struggling readers and writers, we know that even small cracks in a pathway can become big gaps to leap. Think about that again. We know that even small cracks in a pathway can become big gaps to leap. But guess what? This can be true for non-struggling learners as well. Kids who learn many tasks with ease may resist next level literacy tasks that don't come as easily. Kids who don't understand how much more there is to learn in reading and writing may resist the notion that they have anything more to learn. Kids who find it difficult to attend may resist literacy activities that demand so much engagement. In Pinwheels Level 3 and 4, which is our Year 2 program, we make sure that kids discover how much more they can do. 
We fill in gaps by securing a stronger and stronger foundation. And we show the struggling learner that chasms can be crossed. Once again, we walk your child on their journey, leaving no stone unturned, at least no stone at this level of learning. But hold on, kids are young. This is starting to sound like work. And this is supposed to be fun, right? Well, this is a question I get a lot actually. But what about fun? Well, nothing is as fun as success and nothing is a bigger killjoy than discouragement and failure. So we make sure that while kids are learning how to use reading and writing, while they are further developing their skills, there is still play along the way, along the way. things to both climb and explore. And just as importantly, there are places to slow down and rest and enjoy success. We even encourage your child to retrace their steps whenever it's needed. So what does that analogy tell us about the perfect ingredients for continued literacy instruction? So here are the ingredients. Continued explicit teaching, always applied to spelling and writing and applied to reading. Everything taught gets applied. Next ingredient, continued systematic instruction that methodically introduces new vowel, new vowel sounds and spelling patterns. So we want to move along a path that's methodical. And when it comes to vowel sounds, we really lay this out for you in our vowel chart class. Next ingredient, continued challenges. Those fun things to climb that show kids what they can do, gives them a sense of pride and takes them to the next level of practice. Continued games and fun stories. Those things to explore that show kids the interest and enjoyment that independent literacy brings. And never forget this continued sensitivity to the student's needs always working to a level of success and reducing frustration. So back to my student, this next level of learning includes bits and pieces of everything. Reading small stories continues, but the amount of text begins to grow. Intentional copy work and dictation continues, but now including more sounds and syllables, still using short passages to ensure attention engagement, and success. My student also began small writing projects, but progressed from writing on marker boards and sticky notes to writing on paper. Always those next few steps. He mastered manageable spelling tasks, progressing from letter tiles and writing words to writing more sentences and paragraphs. I taught him more common affixes and he tracked them on his ever-growing affix chart. My student mastered more basic vowel sounds using his expanding vowel chart to help him sort the different spelling patterns. He watched his binder information grow and we used all that he produced to show him that he not only could master literacy, but that he was mastering literacy. And be sure to know this, we did fall back now and again. Like many struggling learners, once my student learned long vowel sounds, he began to confuse all the vowel sounds he'd learned thus far. So we rested at this stage for a bit. We went back and we reviewed. We worked back at the short vowel level for a brief period of time before returning to long vowel sounds again. And this is a piece that I feel is so critical for all our students. It doesn't matter what program set, what a program says, whether it's mine or someone else's, students need to work at their level of success and their next level of challenge. And when things become confusing, we don't wanna keep building on a weak foundation. We wanna go back and we wanna review and we wanna build that foundation again. This need to stop 
relearn and review happens now and again for all of us really, but especially for struggling learners. Review is good. Rushing ahead usually means we're building on this weak foundation, which results in weak literacy skills. This is why big classrooms are so challenging for so many students. There is nothing about grade level work that's allowing for this individualized path for students, no matter how much we try to make it so, the demands of a grade always say, you have to be at this point on the path by the end of the year. And it's not really that simple for most kids learning to read and write. This is why Pinwheels is not just a program for your child. It's a teaching tool for you, the educator. We include both how to teach, but also why to use specific strategies. We want you to feel the confidence to modify, to add extra practice when needed, and to slow down when your child needs it most. As discussed in prior podcasts, literacy skills are literally changing and growing brain cells. It's a total revamp of the left hemisphere and it impacts the right hemisphere as well. Brain connections are growing too. These new information highways, like real highways, are creating connections between brain regions, improving efficiency so that sounds, symbols, and word knowledge and word usage become fast and automatic. Like real highways, these new neural pathways take a lot of work in the form of ongoing practice, and they need time. For instance, it takes practice for new sound to letter connections to become automatic. Our brain has to create a new area of the brain scientists have dubbed the letterbox system. This system allows words to be quickly recognized and spelled. Ongoing research indicates that teaching sound to letter connections through writing is more effective than teaching them from reading alone. So we teach reading and writing together. Ongoing research indicates that writing practice should include explicit spelling practice. So our students learn English spelling rules by continuing to break words into sound, then representing those sounds with newly learned spelling patterns. Each and every word requires fast and accurate attention and precision. So we teach spelling patterns by having kids use them in their writing. This kind of creates this triangular foundation for how we teach reading and writing through our pinwheels and wand program. It's always reading, writing, spelling entwined together. So let's go back to my student. As my student progressed on his reading and writing journey, he began to see that he could put his ideas into sentences. Invented spelling was a necessary tool on his path. Invented spelling is a writing system that encourages students to use the sounds they say and hear to write the spelling patterns they know. At first, my student had limited spelling knowledge, of course, but he grew comfortable writing. As he made sound to symbol connections, his handwriting improved. The more he wrote, the more we practiced using high frequency words and the more the spelling of those words were corrected. Meanwhile, he continued to engage in intentional copy work and dictation with editing practice. In these writing tasks, he practiced holding spelling patterns in memory and writing them correctly the first time. So much writing was happening that even he was amazed at his own progress. The more his writing grew, the easier it was for him to read. He was finally ready to call himself a reader and a writer. And by the way, we ended up concluding that his struggles with dyslexia and creating the sound to symbol relationship were so profound that he was having a lot of difficulty writing. And I was still teasing out whether I thought there was a dysgraphia piece. But once he really started making those sound to symbol connections, saying sounds while he writes, uh, he did not manifest any signs of dysgraphia at that point. Although we teach early reading and writing through phonics using sound, all young readers and writers must develop skills called orthography, which is spelling, and morphology, 
which is knowledge of how words are built and their meaning. So think of the rooted in language teaching method in triads. Teach through three modes together, reading, writing, and spelling. Teach students to think three ways, what they say and hear, what they know about how words are built and the meaning behind them, and what they see in terms of spelling patterns. We teach this explicitly and systematically in Pinwheels Levels 3 and 4, which is our year two program. We teach this more generally and systematically in the wand. We teach you, the educator, the heart of this method through our Laying a Path classes, especially both phonics and spelling and word study. We show you how to lovingly and carefully guide your child, how to engage them in hands-on learning that is meaningful, how to teach to a level of success to keep your child on the literacy path while moving at their own pace. Parents tell us they are amazed that each and every small step is packed with so much learning. Going deeper really does get kids further along. Rooted in language is for every learner, providing you with the knowledge and tools you need to navigate the long and winding road to your child's independent reading and writing. So be sure to listen to my next podcast on going deeper into literacy. But rooted in language is especially for the struggling learner. If your child struggles like the student I described and so many others we see, or your child seems to have gotten stuck somewhere on their literacy journey, get help. Nothing is more painful than watching our kids struggle. It is easy to just give up, especially if that seems to make our child the most happy in the moment. But we know reading and writing are crucial in life and in your child's development, even when it's hard for them. We know literacy literally develops our children's brains in ways that audiobooks and writing software never will. We know that you, as a parent, hate floundering in uncertainty just as much as your child does. Let Rooted in Language help you find the answers and then help you be the answer your child needs. We have a Rooted community on Facebook and our website where you can ask questions at rootedinlanguage.com. If you enjoy what you hear, please give us a like, subscribe, and follow. And listen to our next podcast as we venture further into literacy, as children deepen their knowledge and hone their skills. We appreciate all you do to help your child become the best reader and writer they can be. Thanks for listening. This is Rita Sabasco with Rooted in Language. And we'll talk again as we go further down the path to independent reading and writing.